Hello, my friends. It's Dr. Sharon with Clinic Reviews. Clinic Reviews is a three-day NCLEX RN and NCLEX PN review that you can take either online or in person. And today I am going to be teaching you a little bit about psych meds and how to answer questions related to psych meds on the NCLEX. Um, the most common question about psych meds on the NCLEX is side effects. Side effects are things that we expect to happen. They're common. We don't stop the medication for them. Okay, we just, we manage them, we treat them. Now, I've talked in other videos about, in general, common med side effects are headache and nausea. Okay, those are common side effects. And that's true also for psych meds, okay? H headache and nausea are common uh, side effects for all meds, including psych meds. But today we're going to talk about side effects that are specific to psych meds, specifically antidepressants. So first of all, I want to just talk about some things in general that you need to know about antidepressants in order to be able to answer NCLEX questions well, because these are principles that really every nurse knows, okay? First of all, antidepressants take two to four weeks to work. So that means that they will not expect to be feeling better until at least week uh, three, the beginning of week three. They, they have to be taking the med for two weeks before they really start to feel better. And it could take as long as four weeks. Now, here's the thing about depression. Depression has many, many symptoms, including insomnia, not being able to sleep, loss of appetite, anorexia, lack of enjoyment of life, lack of interest in what's going on, and fatigue. Okay, so these are uh, in addition to uh, having trouble concentrating and so forth. When someone starts taking an antidepressant, antidepressants are expected to work on all aspects of depression. So eventually you should get your appetite back. Eventually you should be able to start sleeping better. Eventually you should not be so fatigued. Eventually you should start to take interest in things going on around you. So what happens when you start taking an antidepressant is usually the first type of thing that starts to feel better is that fatigue. So they start being less fatigued, they have more energy, but their, their mental status isn't necessarily better. So they may still uh, be feeling lack of interest, extreme depression feelings, right? So they still feel very discouraged, depressed, um, not interested in life, maybe not interested in continuing to live. They may have felt that way since they started feeling depressed, but they didn't have the energy to act on it. So the biggest risk in the first two weeks as people start to get their energy back but don't necessarily start to enjoy life yet, the biggest risk in the first two weeks is suicide. Okay, so you have to watch for suicide. That is a general principle that will that always is right. If they say, what are you going to watch for? In the, and, it's, and they tell you it's the first two weeks. They may say they've been taking the medication for five days. It says, what are you most concerned about? Risk for suicide. Uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't matter what antidepressant it is. The key thing you're watching for in the first two weeks is suicide. Okay, that's just generally true. It is generally true that they should never drink alcohol when they're taking an antidepressant. Yeah, alcohol is a downer. They're already feeling down. We're giving them an antidepressant to try to bring their mood up. And if they're drinking a downer, ingesting a downer while they're doing that, then it's just screwing everything up. Okay, so that's not a good thing. And antidepressants can decrease blood pressure, which means people have to stand up slowly, right? When they first start the medication, we want to say, stand up slowly. Uh, be concerned if you feel dizzy, right? Because it can decrease blood pressure and it can also cause weight gain. And we have to prepare people for that. So these are side effects. These aren't necessarily things we stop the med for, but we have to manage them and we have to teach people about them. Okay, so those are generally general things that you need to know about antidepressants. All right, the next thing that you should know about antidepressants is that there is a class of antidepressants called MAOIs, monoamine, uh, monoamine, the A is amine, and then the O is oxidase inhibitors, MAOIs. 
MAOIs are the only class of antidepressants that have food restrictions, the only one that have food restrictions. So you should know that if you get a question and they give you the name of the antidepressant, you're like, I have no idea what that is. But then it says, which food would you caution them against eating or which food are you concerned about? Whatever you go, oh, it's an MAOI. Okay, fine. So here's what they have to restrict with their MAOIs. First of all, they the reason they have to restrict these foods is because it can lead to hypertensive crisis. And these foods have tyramine in them. So foods with tyramine, if you care. Um, remember that anything fresh is okay. So fresh meat, fresh fruits, fresh vegetables, all okay. All of that is okay. Except if they talk about fresh bread with yeast, or if they talk about yeast in general, but fresh bread with yeast, like if they identify it as having yeast, you go, no, 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 no. They can't have that. They cannot have bananas, which is a fresh fruit, and they cannot have avocados. Okay, so that's a, I don't know, is it an avocado, a fruit or a vegetable? I don't know. So anything fresh is good except yeast, bananas, and avocados, okay? And then they should avoid anything aged, or processed. So aged cheeses, aged meats, processed meats, hot dogs, pepperoni, salami, that kind of stuff. These are all processed meats. Don't do it. Any aged cheeses out, don't do that. And then they're not allowed to have any of the good stuff like alcohol, chocolate, or caffeine. All the good stuff they're not allowed to have, okay? So those are things you need to remember as far as um, food restrictions for MAOIs. All right, so now what I want to do is I want to talk about general side effects for antidepressants. I talked about how all antidepressants can cause low blood pressure and weight gain. So that's all of them can. You should never have alcohol with an antidepressant. Um, they take two to four weeks to work. And in the first two weeks, you're worried about suicide. Then I talked about the specific foods that are contraindicated with the MAOIs. Otherwise, foods are not contraindicated with antidepressants, okay? So the next thing I want to talk about is anticholinergic side effects. Anticholinergic side effects are common with a lot of different medications, but anticholinergic side effects are, are true with all antidepressants. And so I want you to understand what anticholinergic means. So I can teach you this. I can say these are the anticholinergic side effects, fine. But I want to teach you why we have these anticholinergic side effects. So first of all, you should know, well, you don't have to know this, but I like to know. I think this is fascinating. So the autonomic nervous system is the umbrella term for the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous systems. Now, I remember the autonomic nervous system by remembering that it's the automatic nervous system, okay? It controls all those things that happen automatically that we don't have conscious control over. So I can say, oh, Heart rate, go up, go up, come on. Speed it, speed up, speed up. Or, or you know, your, your heart, you feel like your heart is racing. You go, slow it down. Come on, slow it down. I mean, look, we can do yoga and slow our heart rate and all this kind of stuff, but we don't have conscious control over our heart rate. And we don't have any conscious control over how fast our gut is moving, right? Peristaltic activity. I can't be like, oh, I'm so constipated. Come on, pick it up, pick it up, come on got to get it moving, get it moving, keep going, keep going, right? I don't have any conscious control over how fast my GI tract is moving. And so these are the things that are under the control of the autonomic nervous system. And the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system are the two branches of the autonomic nervous system. And that shouldn't surprise you. We have one or two of just about everything in our body. One heart, uh, one brain, two eyes, one mouth, two ears, two hands, um, two lungs, two kidneys, two branches of the autonomic nervous system. So that's not that surprising. We have two of so many things in our body. So it fits the pattern. And the sympathetic nervous system is what we call our, the fight or flight uh, nervous system. And the parasympathetic nervous system, we call the rest and digest nervous system. Now, the fight or flight nervous system has, uh, or the sympathetic nervous system, secretes neurotransmitters. So how does the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system control anything, right? How does that happen? Well, there are nerves that are part of the various nervous systems. And these nerves uh, get close to organs 
and they don't even have to get that close to the organ itself. What happens is the sympathetic nervous system releases chemicals that have an effect on the heart, have an effect on the heart, have an effect on the gut, have an effect on the lungs. And so these, these nerves secrete these chemicals. And because they're secreted by the nerves, we call them neurotransmitters. And there are, there are many neurotransmitters, many is an extreme word, I guess. There's a handful of neurotransmitters that the sympathetic nervous system secretes, but I'm only going to talk about one of them, and I'm going to talk about epinephrine. Epinephrine is like the most potent stimulant we have in the body. I mean, it's like a super stimulant. How do I know it's a super stimulant? I know because do you know when we give epinephrine, what emergency situation we give epinephrine? Well, yes, when somebody has an allergic reaction, we give it. But what other hospital-based emergency situation do we give epinephrine? When the heart stops. You can give epinephrine. Somebody's heart is dead. It's not beating. It is just laying there completely dead. And you can give them epinephrine and actually make their heart start beating again. Now, if that's not a super stimulant, I don't know what is, right? It is like the most potent stimulant ever. And the neurotransmitter that's released by the parasympathetic nervous system, which is our rest and digest system, is acetylcholine. So let's start out talking about the fight or flight, the sympathetic nervous system. Nurses, when they're teaching about this, often say, you know, this is uh, what what is stimulated when you have a midnight intruder. And that's so true. This is the sympathetic nervous system. It's what's stimulated when you have a midnight intruder. But I don't know about you, I haven't had a lot of midnight intruders. Now we have a ton of dogs and sometimes our dogs start barking in the middle of the night, which if we had a midnight intruder would probably scare them off. But either way, it scares me when my dogs start barking in the middle of the night. But other than that, I've never really experienced a midnight intruder. So I prefer to think of something that is much more common and that I experience all the time. So I want to talk about what it's like to work a 12-hour shift. So have you noticed that sometimes you can't even hardly sleep the night before, right? Especially if like it's a clinical day or it's your first day of work or it's your first day without the, the preceptor there seeing what you're doing. And you can hardly sleep because your sympathetic nervous system is on. When we talk about sympathetic parasympathetic nervous system, the sympathetic nervous system, neither one of these nervous systems are completely off, but some of the times one is on more than the other one and they balance each other out over time. And so when we're getting ready to go for a 12 hour shift or we're working at the hospital, our sympathetic nervous system is on and we are secreting these stimulants like epinephrine, norepinephrine, and so forth, right? And, and what does that do? Well, first of all, it increases our heart rate and our blood pressure. So that's not that surprising, okay? It's, it's the uh, fight or flight response, of course, it stimulates increased heart rate, increased blood pressure. But do you know what else it does? It causes alveolar dilation so we can get more oxygen so that our heart rate goes up, it demands more oxygen, we can get it. Our blood pressure goes up, it demands more oxygen, we can get it. So we have alveolar dilation, but also pupillary dilation. So dilation is what happens with the sympathetic nervous system. So it causes alveolar dilation and pupillary dilation. And it also decreases GI activity. Now that may seem sort of strange that a stimulate would a stimulate stimulant would decrease GI activity. But think about it. In the middle of a code, do you really want to say, um, yeah, excuse me just for a minute. I got to run to the bathroom. <laughs> sorry about that. Oh, I'm so sorry. Right? You don't want to be doing that. Uh, you're like, no way, man. I got to be able to go. Or how about, you know, you're just getting ready to go to lunch, 11 o'clock, 1130, 12 o'clock, maybe later, depending how busy your day is. You're just getting ready to go to lunch. And all of a sudden the charger says, oh, you're getting an admission from the ED. And then the phone rings and it's ED calling to give you a report. And you're like, oh my word, I was just going to go to lunch, but I'm back on again, right? So I can't be, I can't be running to the bathroom just any time or whatever. And so it decreases GI activity. And, and so your stomach's not completely growling. You're not having to run to the bathroom, it, but it also decreases secretion. So you have a dry mouth. Um, I remember when I first started working in the hospital, I would used to say to my patients, I don't know why they keep it so dry up here. The hospital is so dry. 
I, I mean, I never drink this much when I'm at home. Like, I seriously thought the hospital was just really, really dry. Okay, the hospital is not really, really dry. My mouth is really, really dry because my sympathetic nervous system is on. So um, it, it causes dry mouth, constipation, and so forth, okay? Now, the other thing it does is it causes bladder relaxation. Again, that seems a little opposite, but think about that. If your bladder contracts, you feel like you have to void, right? You have to urinate. You have to excrete that, so it's contracting. So if it relaxes, you can hold a lot more urine, and the sphincters constrict. They constrict or contract so that even if you're feeling like you have to go, it can't get out. So I don't know about you, but I know in my experience, nurses are taught in nursing school, make sure you go to the bathroom at least once during your shift because nurses can literally go 12 hours without going to the bathroom one time because we don't even think about it. We're so busy and our sympathetic nervous system is on big time and our bladder's relaxed, our sphincters are contra contracted. I mean, none of us want to be doing chest compressions and accidentally, you know, oh, sorry about the little incontinence, right? No way, man, our sphincters are contracted, our bladder's relaxed, we can, you know, we go on 10 hours, 12 hours, whatever, and, and we're told, make sure you go to the bathroom at least once because you don't want to get a UTI, right? All right, so that is what happens with the uh, sympathetic nervous system. Now, it should make sense that the parasympathetic nervous system and the acetylcholine is the neurotransmitter, does the exact opposite. So it decreases heart rate, it decreases blood pressure. It causes alveolar and pupillary constriction. It increases GI activity, bladder contraction, sphincter relaxation. Have you ever, um, at the end of your 12 hour shift, you get in the car to go home and all of a sudden your stomach just starts growling, just and you're like, oh my word, I'm stuck starving. And you didn't even have to think about going to the bathroom all day, but all of a sudden you're like going a hundred miles an hour to get home because you like got to go. Um, and I've decided that nurses love language is this feed me when I get home from work. That's nurses love language. Feed me when I get home from work. And here's why I think it's nurses love language. First of all, we're starving. Second of all, We've made so many decisions over the course of any given shift that we don't want to make any more decisions. I'm tired of making decisions. No more decisions. Just feed me. Put food in front of my face. I will eat it. I, you know what I like. Just feed me, right? So if you're uh, dating, not yet married, and you're looking for someone who you can get married to or have a lifetime partnership with, that should be something that you take into consideration. Do they feed me when I get off of work? Because that's very, very important. All right, so what does that mean then? So the epinephrine or the sympathetic nervous system, the fight or flight, that leads to dry mouth, blurred vision, constipation, and bladder retention. Dry mouth because of the GI secretions, blurred vision because of the pupillary dilation, constipation because of GI, GI activity, and bladder retention because of a relaxed uh, bladder. And I don't know if you remember, when I was a kid, I used to go to the eye doctor. I don't know if they still do this. I think technology has changed. They don't need to do this so much anymore. But when I was a kid, I used to go to the eye doctor, and they would put dr drops in my eyes to dilate my pupils. Do you remember having that done? Dilate your eyes to look in the back of your eyes so they could see back there. And then you would leave, right, and your pupils are still dilated. And, you know, they'd give you those sunglasses. Do you remember how they used to give you those, pl like, plastic, cheap, horrible sunglasses? that you could wear home. I bet you don't remember those. I remember those. And because the sun was killing you because you went outside, your pupils were all dilated. Everything's blurry. You're like, I can't see anything, right? So that's what we're talking about here, uh, blurred vision. Okay. So, well, what happens with acetylcholine? Well, with acetylcholine, um, decreased heart rate, decreased blood pressure, increased secretion. So now you've got saliva. You feel like you have to have a bowel movement. You feel like you got to, you know, urinate. Um, and so forth. So, so let's say that someone has a symptomatic bradycardia. Symptomatic bradycardia is a slow heart rate that is symptomatic. So someone can have a heart rate of 50 and they're just fine. Their blood pressure is fine. Everything's fine. That's not symptomatic bradycardia. Symptomatic bradycardia is when the blood pressure is also very low in response to a low heart rate. So someone has symptomatic bradycardia, okay? So, and you see that acetylcholine 
decreases heart rate and epinephrine increases heart rate. So someone has symptomatic bradycardia, am I going to give them a bolus of epinephrine? Is that what we're going to do? No. <laughs> okay. Epinephrine can restart a dead heart. I think giving them epinephrine for a slow heart rate is a little bit overkill. And we're going to take them from a heart rate of like 45 to a heart rate of like 180. And I really don't want to do that. Like, I really don't want to do that. So we save the epinephrine for like really dangerous situations. So if that's the case, wouldn't it be nice if we could give an anti-acetylcholine? I mean, acetylcholine is decreasing their heart rate. So if I could give them an anti-acetylcholine, then I could get their heart rate up. Gosh, wouldn't that be nice if uh, pharma, pharmacy companies could develop an anti-acetylcholine? Oh, man, that would be nice. Wait a minute. They did. It's called an anticholinergic, an anticholinergic. Instead of calling it an anti-acetylcholine, they call it an anticholinergic. So when you give an anticholinergic, you are essentially blocking the body's response to acetylcholine. The body can be secreting it, but it's blocking the body's response to it. Now, if you block the body's response to it, you don't have a decreased heart rate, what are you going to have? You're going to have an increased heart rate. You won't have a decreased blood pressure. You'll have an increased blood pressure. You won't have alveolar constriction. You'll have alveolar dilation and so forth. You'll have decreased GI activity, bladder relaxation, sphincter contraction because you're blocking the acetylcholine. So anticholinergics have the effect like giving epinephrine, but it's not as extreme. It's like a, a low level uh, dose of epinephrine, right? When we give an anti cholinergic. So if that's the case, then we can use an anticholinergic to treat symptomatic bradycardia. And the drug that we use is atropine. So that just will help you if you get a question about like, how do you treat symptomatic bradycardia? Well, we give atropine, that's an anticholinergic. And yes, it has side effects of dry mouth, blurred vision, constipation, and bladder retention. That's what it does. It's an anticholinergic. So if, if all psych drugs have anticholinergic side effects, that means you should expect someone who's taking a psych drug, particularly, particularly antidepressants, you should expect them to have a dry mouth, constipation, blurred vision, and bladder retention. And those are expected. Side effects are expected. We treat them. We don't stop the drug for those. So what kind of things can you do? Because, I mean, they might ask you, like, what are the side effects or what are you going to teach, right? But what they'd like to do is say, which of the following statements indicates the patient needs further teaching? And you go, huh? Okay, let's see. They're taking an, an antidepressant. So which one indicates they need further teaching? Well, maybe it says, I'm going to stop taking the fiber I normally take every day. I'm going to stop taking the fiber I normally take every day. Well, why would you stop taking the fiber? Constipation is a problem. Don't stop taking the fiber. Constipation is going to be a side effect. We're starting you on this antidepressant. You need to continue or maybe even increase the fiber that you were taking, right? So these are some things to think about when we teach pe people so are we going to tell them it's okay to drive? Well, blurred vision, you know, I tell them, what I would tell them is uh, see how you respond to the medication before you drive. Be careful, right? Carefully see how you're going to respond to the medication before you drive. Um, you need to, what do you do to bladder, to treat bladder retention? Well, you might have to sit on the toilet a little bit longer. You might need to put some, uh, 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 run some warm water um, over your perineum while you're sitting on the toilet or run water or just sit there longer or whatever it is, right? Increase exercise, increase fiber, maybe chew on some sugarless candies, uh, maybe chew gum, maybe keep a water bottle handy to have a couple sips here and there. So these are things that we teach our patients because we don't just teach them, teach them what the side effects are. We teach them, it's our job as nurses, we're the nurses, we teach them how to manage the side effects. So these are critical things. Um, over the next couple uh, times that I do questions with you, we're going to focus on side effects of psych drugs. So watch for those videos coming out, and I hope this was helpful to you. Thank you.